Unit 2.1, Stress Strain Diagrams. The course outcome that we are working on is to demonstrate an understanding of the stress strain behavior of materials and the ability to extract information from the stress strain curve. The outcome for this lesson is for you to be able to extract the modulus of elasticity, the yield stress, ultimate stress, and failure strain from a stress strain curve for both normal and shear stress strain curves. Let's talk a little bit about the mechanical properties of materials. Uh, to be able to predict the behavior of our designs when subjected to loads, we must know the mechanical properties of our materials. Uh, for example, we don't want the things we build to fail when subjected to the typical loads that will be applied during use. Knowing what internal stresses will exist and ensuring that those stresses are less than the failure stresses of our materials is crucial. The mechanical properties of materials can be determined through laboratory testing. Here is a photograph of a test in progress. What we have here is a testing machine and these are the clamps of the machine and inside the clamps is a test specimen. We call this a dog bone specimen because it is wider at the top and bottom where the clamps uh, attach and it is narrow in the middle of the specimen. The purpose for making a dog bone specimen is so that the failure and the elongation that occurs to the sample during testing occurs here in this con region of constant cross-section and so that we don't get a, uh, a failure uh, in the vicinity of the clamp where we can get stress concentrations. Now during the test we're going to pull on the specimen and it is going to get longer and it will be feeling a stress and it, the stress will gradually increase from uh, from nothing, from zero, up to a point of failure. And prior to testing, we will m pick two points on the specimen that we will, uh, and the distance between those two points, we will call our gauge length. And we're going to measure the change in that length during the test. And between those two points, the cross-section is kept constant, and we measure that cross-section before the test. Once the measurements have been made, we gradually apply a load, and we continue to load the specimen until failure. And during testing, we plot the load versus the elongation, or the change in length of the specimen. It would be useful to see a tensile test performed in the laboratory. The following website, available at wn.com slash tensile underscore test pound slash videos, or at this YouTube link is a, a very useful tensile test videos and many others can be found on the internet. Let's go ahead and watch this one now. In this video a tensile test is demonstrated and the tensile test is shown for material that experiences uh, yielding. Here's the testing equipment and we'll look at a test specimen. Now you can see the specimen has been uh, divided into uh, sections this uh, the length between the first and last line we're going to call the gauge length. It'll be the original length. Also measured before testing is the original diameter of the specimen. The test specimen is inserted into the testing machine. Next, a device called an extensometer will be placed on the specimen. The purpose of the extensometer is to measure the change in length of the specimen during testing. You can see that the extensometer is uh, attaching to the specimen at the top and bottom mark, so that is the gauge length of the specimen. Next the operator will begin to a, apply a load to the specimen, and the machine will measure 
what the load is uh, and plot it on this chart. And the load is plotted on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis is the elongation. And it'll be in units of millimeters. So the test has begun. The loading occurs slowly so that we can graph the useful properties of the material. Now notice as this load is being applied that the force versus elongation is uh, most uh, is approximately linear. This is a very important behavior of many of the engineering materials that we use. But it doesn't stay linear. At some point, it, that linear behavior comes to an abrupt end. And now you can see uh, a phenomenon we call yielding. That is where under the same load here at about 28 kilonewtons, the material is elongating. So it is stretching without increasing the load. You can see in the picture on the left that the specimen is elongating slowly. Now at some point that yielding comes to an end and the specimen begins to gain strength again. This is the uh, phenomenon we call strain hardening. And the strength will continue to increase until an ultimate point is reached. Now you can see considerable stretching in the material. What next we're going to experience is that it, at some point in the material it will begin to neck right here you see it occurring where at a single point it is becoming very thin that is the formation of a neck and that corresponds to this downward slope on the diagram and now the material has failed and that is the end of the test and from the test we get this diagram which is a force versus elongation diagram now we're going to look a little bit more closely at this diagram. A force versus elongation diagram was produced in the tinsel test video we just watched. And this is a useful diagram, but it could even be more useful if we change the vertical axis from force to stress, normal stress. And we can convert force to normal stress by dividing the force by the original cross-sectional area. It would also be useful to change elongation on the horizontal axis to strain. And we can convert elongation to normal strain by dividing change in length elongation by the original gauge length, L0. That was the length of the specimen prior to testing. Doing so allows us to plot what we'll call a stress-strain diagram. And this is useful uh, because it is not dependent on the size of the test specimen. And the information we can get from the stress-strain diagram can be applied to material cross-sections of any size. Now this is a typical stress-strain diagram for mild steel. And there's some very important things going on right at the very beginning of this test. And it would be useful to zoom in on that area so we can see it more clearly. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, I've looked at just the very uh, front end portion of that stress strain diagram. And there's some useful information on this graph that we are very interested in. The first is what we'll call the proportional limit. That's this point approximately here that represents the top of this linear portion of the stress strain diagram. You can see that when uh, at the beginning of the test, the load and therefore the stress is zero and the strain is zero. And we begin to load the specimen. The behavior is linear. We get an equal change in strain uh, for every uh, uniform change in stress. And that continues to the proportional limit. Just beyond the proportional limit is a point we call the yield point. And the yield point uh, for this material, which is mild steel is fairly clear and it is approximately 36 KSI call that the yield stress or the yield strength the area to the left of the yield strength is what we will call the elastic region at yielding uh, we get this phenomenon where the material stretches or elongates without an increase in force or an increase in stress. We call this the plastic region. The yield strength of a material is very valuable. T 
to engineers, one of the reasons the yield strength is so important is that when a material is loaded and a stress is induced, if the stress in the material is less than the yield stress, then when the load is released, the elongation or the strain returns to zero and there is no permanent deformation. That means that when we load the material to a point of stress that is less than the yield point, it behaves like a spring and it will spring back to its original shape. But if the yield stress is exceeded, then that will result in a permanent deformation in the material. For many of the products we engineer, we hope to never exceed the yield stress because that will result in a permanent deformation in the product and possibly uh, problems with its performance. So most of the engineering we do will be here in the elastic region where the stress strain behavior is linear. That's really convenient for engineering. Another important property that can be found in this portion of the stress strain curve is the modulus of elasticity or also called the elastic modulus or Young's modulus. It is the slope of the linear portion of the stress strain curve. If we take a point somewhere in the linear portion and find its stress and its corresponding strain, we can calculate the slope and thus the modulus of elasticity. For example, for this diagram, E, which represents the modulus of elasticity, is equal to the stress at this point divided by the course, its corresponding strain. The stress is 30 KSI. The strain is 0 0.001. This gives us a value of 30,000 KSI. That's equal to 30 million PSI. Values for modulus of elasticity are typically very large. Okay, now we're back to looking at the whole stress strain diagram all the way up to failure. We can find the ultimate stress of the material by looking here, right at the peak of the curve, the highest point it ever gets to. We call that the ultimate stress or the ultimate strength. For this material, it's about 59 KSI. Another useful point is the fracture stress and its corresponding fracture strain, which would be down here at about 0.3 8. We'll now divide the stress strain curve into regions. The very first part of this curve was the elastic region where we get elastic behavior. But you can see in this diagram for mild steel that occurs very early on in this test and we have a lot more strain before it finally fails. The next region we call yielding. That's where this yielding phenomenon occurs where we get strain without an increase in stress. The next region is strain hardening, where the strength begins again to increase up till ultimate stress. At this point, if you recall from the video, this is where a neck formed in the specimen. And from that point on, the stress strain diagram began to curve downward. We call that necking, and it continues until failure. Here's a part of a stress strain diagram for an aluminum alloy. You can see that for this aluminum alloy, uh, there is no yielding phenomenon. And that can make determination of the yield stress or yield strength of the material somewhat difficult to determine. One method that exists is called the 0.2% offset method for determining yield strength. For this method, a strain value of 0 0.002 is identified on the chart. Then a line is drawn parallel to the initial linear portion of the data. And where that line intersects the data curve for the stress strain diagram, that point we will identify as the yield stress. This is just one method and others exist for finding yield stress in materials that do not experience the yielding phenomenon we saw in mild steel. Finally, let's consider the stress strain diagram for shear stress and strain. You'll note that this diagram looks a lot like the diagram for normal stress and strain. But instead of sigma or normal stress, we plot tau or shear stress on the vertical axis and shear strain on the horizontal axis. We see a proportional limit point and yield point, which is very similar. 
Okay, on this diagram, we see a proportional limit point, ultimate point, and a failure point. Also, what we see is similar to the normal stress strain diagram, we also see a linear portion of this stress strain curve, and the slope we will call the shear modulus. And we, it is given the symbol capital G. Now, material properties of a variety of materials can be found uh, in many ref different sources. In this reference, we have material properties for both metallic and non-metallic materials that are common to engineering. Here you will see on this table the modulus of elasticity, E, the modulus of rigidity, G, values for yield strength and ultimate strength, and percent elongation in a two-inch specimen up to failure. We will talk about these other properties later. And we're done.